Month to month to month to month. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah. Two weeks. Praise God. Not this past weekend, but uh, three weeks ago, we had 1,250 people here. Yeah. Yeah. La the weekend following that, we had 1,350 people here. And last weekend, we had just shy of 1,200 people here. So um, the church is growing. Praise God for that. Um, we also, uh, coming up on October 29th, we're going to have what's called a VIP party. That's where we, we kind of introduce the staff and, and the, the vision of the church to all of the first-time visitors. We're, we're going to invite over 400 people to that. Wow. Uh, and that's since our last uh, VIP party, which happened, I think, in late June. So we're we're all set um, in terms of that. So that's that's praise God for that. Do you need security people there? Um, yes, we will need security people there. The other thing is on October 31st, we're asking everybody to participate in Super Size Halloween. We're going to give you all the signs you need for your house. We're going to give you all the stickers you need for your candy. All you need to do is be willing to stick stickers on supersized candy bars uh, to hand out to the kids in your neighborhood. We want your house to be known <laughs> as the place to go, and those stickers will have all kinds of information about Jesus and about our church. It's a great way to turn something that is very secular and, and very kind of unholy into something that's good. So we, we ask you to think about that as well. Amen. All right? Um, and then, first week of November, we're going to be kicking off our food and gift drive for Christmas time. So you guys know that last year we, we gift wrapped some two or 3,000 gifts. Remember that old thing? We're doing that again this year. So you'll hear that again coming up. Um, so make sure that you look at that. If you're not getting e-news, if you're not getting that, I, I, I really need you to call the church office and give them your email address so that we can get you on e-news. E-news has got all of this stuff in it. George works on it tirelessly, he and Danny. And so if you guys can do that, that tell, will tell you everything that's going on in the church. Amen? Amen. All right. So why don't we pray? And then um, after we pray, we're going to jump right into chapter 5. But before we jump into chapter 5, I, I want to open with some remarks. But let's pray first. Father, we thank you for the night to come to study your word and to look at the Lamb, the Lamb of God who brings salvation to the world and who is the one who will eventually open the seven seals and begin that great period of great tribulation and conflict in the world. And Lord, as we, your people, stand before this text tonight, uh, this text is, is in a miraculous text. It's, it's a text of judgment for sure but it's also a text of redemption. And I pray, Father, that we always remember that it is you who have saved us, not ourselves, nothing that we've done, and therefore we can rejoice even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of difficulty, even in the midst of trial. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Tonight we're going to look at chapter 5. If you would, We're going to go through kind of chapters 1 through 4 tonight, really brief. We're going to look at chapter 5 tonight. But next week, next week, we're going to begin chapter 6. Chapter 6 begins a whole new aspect of what we've been studying. It begins the breaking of the seven seals. And, and you'll hear much more about that. But I will tell you, I've been studying it quite a bit over the last many weeks. And... Um, in some ways, I'm, I'm extraordinarily sad in terms of what I read because it'll be a time of great conflict. Mm. Um, and I know that much of the world will not avoid it. Uh, it will be a time when um, it will be unheralded. There, there will never be a time like what is about to happen. Um, and I think we as, as God's people um, if there's a time to be sober-minded about God's Word, the next coming weeks is really that time. I would urge you over the next several weeks, if you can, start to read ahead a little bit. Read chapter 6 for next week, 
Um, we're only going to review the first eight verses next week. The following week, we'll only review, I think, three verses. And then the following week, we'll finish chapter 6. So we'll spend six week, three weeks on chapter 6. And that'll take us through the first six seals. All right? And then after that, we'll begin chapter 7. Um, I don't anticipate us getting through chapter 11, chapter 12 before another uh, three or four months. That's kind of the pace that we're running, okay? Um, but it, it's, it's a sobering uh, section of Scripture. It's not a section of Scripture that a lot of people preach about and not a lot of people talk about because it is so sobering, right? But it's God's Word. And um, one of the things about expository preaching and expository teaching, which is what I do, is that you have to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, all the things you like and all the things you don't like. And this is one of those texts that not a lot of people like to talk about because it is very difficult. It's not difficult to understand necessarily, but the message is very difficult. Yes. All right? So... Um, that's kind of the precursor. Aren't you glad you came to church tonight? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, but let's look at chapter 5. But before we do that, let's summarize where we were in chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. So you remember, in terms of chapter 1, it is the opening prologue. Everybody remember that? Remember that? Mm -hmm. And it really is split into three sections. Verses 1 through 6. They give us a synopsis of 11 key characteristics of the book. And it says to us, those that read and hear and heed enjoy a blessing from this book. So even though what we're about to study in the coming weeks is very difficult, God says we receive a blessing from understanding that and reading it and heeding it. And then verses 7 and 8 of chapter 1, it gives us a preview of the major theme of the book. It is the second coming of Christ as king and conqueror over Satan, over wickedness, and over all evil. Praise God. Amen? And then verses 9 through 20, it gives us the first vision of the glorified Christ. He is revealed as a great encouragement to the church. In the midst of this book that talks about persecution and difficulty, we see Christ as the glorified Christ. He is the one that has it all together. He is sovereign. He is the conqueror. We're on the winning team. Therefore, we should be praising him, even in the midst of all the craziness that goes on. Right? So that's kind of chapter one. And then chapter two begins. And it, it, it's really the kickoff of, of that section of, of Revelations that talks about the things that are. Right? And it talks about the seven churches that are located in Asia Minor. Minor, It's modern-day Turkey. And the first church it talks about is Ephesus. Remember that? And Ephesus was a great church. It was a church that was doing all the right things. But you remember that Christ says to them, listen, in essence, don't become so legalistic in your practices that you forget your first love. Amen. Don't become so legalistic in what you're doing that you forget Christ's love and his mercy and his grace and make sure that you share that with people. So it's a great message for the church. But Ephesus was a great church. And then we come to Smyrna. Smyrna was only one of two churches that did not receive a, a, a word of, of caution. Right? Smyrna was a church that was persecuted they were suffering greatly. And Christ says, listen, I, I know that you think that, you know, you're suffering and that you're really good for nothing and that you're really not much. And he says, I know that you, you think you're poor, but you're really rich. You're spiritually rich. And so Smyrna was, was the persecuted church. And Christ's encouragement to them is stand firm in Christ. Don't give up. Even when things are really hard and really difficult, don't give up. That's a good word for us as a church, right? Because when things get tired, either for a church, or they get difficult for the church, or even us as individuals, what's God's word to us? Don't give up. He is still our Savior. He is still our King. He is still can do all things. So that, that's a good word. 
And then Pergamum comes along. And it's a church that compromised with the world through false teaching. It allowed false teaching to start to work its way into the church. And there were problems as a result of that. And God says to that church, return to God's word. Don't, don't follow that false teaching, but turn to God's word. Remember, don't forget what you have learned and make it part of your life. And so that, that was a, one of those churches that received a warning from Christ. But then we turn to the church at Thyatira. And you recall that that was a church that tolerated sin within its midst. In fact, the language of that, of the Greek in that, that section of scripture, means that the writer is writing to the leadership of that church. They're writing to the pastors of that church. It was the pastors that were tolerating sin in its midst. And when the head of the body allows that to occur, what happens to the body as a whole? It just gets sick, right? And that's what happened. That's what was going on. And Christ says to them, be steadfast in your commitment to Christ. Don't, don't turn away from your commitment to him and his teaching. So that's kind of the summary of chapter 2. It's, it's the first four churches where he covers the things that are. And then he picks up with the last three churches in chapter 3. And you remember the first of those is Sardis. Now, Sardis was an interesting church. It was a church that had a name for being alive, but they were really what? Dead. Dead. So they looked good on the outside. They were dressed in their Sunday meeting clothes. They were doing all the right stuff. But what was happening? On the inside, they were dead. They did not know Christ. They were doing all the right things from an image perspective, but in reality, they did not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Christ tells them, listen, you got to return. you got to come back to me. All right? And then Philadelphia. Philadelphia is the second church that did not receive a warning from Christ. It was a faithful church in the midst of great persecution. You remember it talked about the synagogue of Satan. That there were men and women there that were trying to just literally destroy the church. And they were standing firm. They had never turned away from Christ or his word. What's a great word for the church? And then the last church, Laodicea. Laodicea was a church that was neither cold nor hot. Therefore, Christ is going to spit them out of, the, out of his mouth. They were good for nothing. They, they were making him sick. And even, you recall, when we studied that, we see this, this letter to this church that is so difficult, it's so hard, it's so full of uh, just commendation about what you're not doing right. But then Christ says, I stand at the door and knock. Right? So even in the midst of that, Christ is coming to the church and he's saying, listen, I know that you're off target, that you're not following me, but I'm standing at the door and knock, and I want to come in and be with you. It is a great word of Christ's desire to, to restore and, and to renew that church. What's interesting is all it would have taken is one person to open the door. That's all it would have taken. And yet we see no sign of that. Right? And, and those of us who have friends and, and family members and, and co-workers and neighbors that we've shared Christ with and, and they just seem so hard, they seem to seem so standoffish, I would say to you, remember, Christ is standing at the door and he's still knocking. You never know what the Holy Spirit is doing behind the scenes. So continue to stand at the door. Continue to pray for them. Because Christ can do miraculous things, even when we think it looks bleak and that there's no point of even continuing. So I, I, even though that's a that tough message for that church, I think there's a ray of hope in the clouds for that one, right? And then we turn to chapter 4. Now, chapter 4 and chapter 5 begin another prologue to what's about to kick off in chapter 6 through 22. So chapter 4, you remember, was the vision of heaven. Remember that last week? And we, we saw that. And that 
there is this great picture of what's going on in heaven and who's there and what they're doing and and who is in, in charge and all those things it is a wonderful picture we can't get our minds around it right and it provides the throne room of god it's the picture of where everything now is going to start to take place from it talks about its inhabitants and all of their actions now tonight we turn to chapter 5 and chapter 5 is the vision of the lamb it's the second vision of Christ as the Lamb of God. So before we jump into actually studying each verse, let's read the chapter, and then we'll look at each verse, verse by verse. Okay? So let's begin chapter 5, verse 1. And it says, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming, with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or look into it. And I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing, as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came and he took it out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, having each one a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals, for thou wast slain, and didst purchase from God with thy blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And thou hast made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. And I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and on the sea, and all things in them, I heard, say, I heard saying, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, be blessings, and honor, and glory, and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. Then the elders fell down and worshipped. Wow. What a scene. Isn't that an amazing scene? So here's what we see as a kind of a, an overarching picture of this chapter. We see that Christ is presented as the rightful owner of all creation who's about to redeem the world from sin and from Satan and from evil and death. So chapters 4 and 5, they set this stage for the judgment of God that is described beginning in chapter 6 and runs through the rest of the book. <coughs> All right, so everybody see that? This is kind of the prologue. This is the, this is, you know, you're getting ready. You, you're putting on your suit for, for church. Th things are about to happen, right? And then you can see that this section of scripture is really divided into three separate areas. First, there's this search for the worthy one to break the seals in verses 1 through 4. And then there's the selection of the worthy one in verses 5 through 7. And then there's the song of the worthy one in verses 8 through 14. And remember, we saw songs back in chapter 4, right? Remember that? Mm -hmm. So now this is going to continue here in this, this section, this chapter. So let's look at verse 1. It says, and I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a, a voice, I'm sorry, chapter 5. I was on chapter 6, sorry. 
And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with the seven seals. So John is established as an eyewitness to the scene of the Lamb. Did you notice that? That he is actually there. That word, I saw, in the Greek is literally, I looked. So he's there. He's an eyewitness to what's about to happen. And he sees he who sat on the throne, that's God himself, right? John sees God himself. It's a staggering picture. I don't think we've seen that before, right? So it's an amazing picture. And then he's given a book. In the Greek, it's literally biblion. And it literally means a scroll, okay? And, and you'll see that again in Revelation 6, verse 14, that same exact phrase. And then it says that this scroll is written on the inside and on the back, and it's sealed with seven seals. So this is not a will, this is not a contract, but, but it's, it's a deed. It's a deed, all right? Roman contracts and deeds included writings on the inside and on the outside. Right? And they had seven seals. So John is, is giving them an image of, uh, of what is they knew of in that day and time. Ezekiel, he saw this exact same vision all the way back in Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. Right? Jewish title and deeds in that day and time, they were folded and they were signed, requiring at least three signatures on the flaps. And a portion of the title deed would be written on each flap with a written signature on that flap. We see that picture in Jeremiah 32. So this is more like the Roman picture, okay? The scroll in chapter 5 is a title deed to the earth and all of its creation, all right? It describes how Christ is going to begin to regain his rightful inheritance of all creation. It's a scroll of judgment, there's no doubt. If you read chapter 6, I mean, you'll, you'll stand shaking in your boots. If you really sit down and read that, you'll say, oh Lord, I, I wish that wouldn't be the case. But it will be the case. But that's what this scroll describes, right? But I want you to also notice something. As we read the next coming chapters, it's also a scroll of redemption. There is also time where Christ is revealed to the world. Many will come to know him during this period of time. So on one hand, it's judgment, but on the other hand, it's also redemption. Okay? We're going to see both of those things occurring as these seals are broken. All right? Everybody okay so far? All right. Then he says, and I saw a strong angel. You guys notice that? Now, there's a lot of arguments about this. Who is this angel? Right? Some say it's Michael. Others say it's Gabriel. Here's, here's the reality. We don't know. We don't know who it is. Right? But he proclaimed with a loud voice. So the picture here is this angel is standing in heaven, and he is proclaiming throughout the entire universe what's about to happen. This is a proclamation to all of creation about what's, about what's going to take place. So it's an amazing picture. And then the question is posed, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? Did you notice that? And there is the, this whole thing about who is this going to be? And there, the question centers on two things. Who's got the virtuous character and who has the divine right to qualify to break the seals? That's question one. And then question two, who has the ability to destroy Satan and all his works? So whoever's going to break these seals has got to have both of those attributes. All powerful, but all holy. Okay? Does that make sense? And notice that they do this search all throughout all of creation. And there is no one worthy enough to fulfill this request. No one. None of us could fill it, fulfill it. None of the great saints could fill it. None of the apostles could fill it. There's this, this search throughout the entire universe. 
and it goes from heaven to hell, and no one is capable to open the scroll. It's an amazing picture, right? Can you imagine what heaven must have been like as that search is going on? <clears throat> must have been quiet, just like you are right now, mm -hmm. right? Think about that, right? Who, who can do this? And, and nobody's found. And the result is that John begins to weep in heaven. And, and literally, that, that, that weeping of John is over the possibility that evil and Satan and wickedness they're, they're going to they're gonna win. That, that there's no one found to open this scroll. John's weeping, it's cer certainly it's sincere, but it's premature, right? Uh, this is the only time we see tears in heaven, by the way. No other time in all of Scripture do we see tears in heaven. And John is weeping over the possibility of wickedness reigning, right? And this word weep is literally this word strong, unrestrained, unrestrained emotion. So it's the same word that we see when Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. You remember that? Mm -hmm. That he weeped over Jerusalem. It's the same word when Peter wept when he betrayed Jesus. It's uncontrolled weeping. Have, have you ever experienced somebody that goes through that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost unconsolable. Right? And so that's the picture that we see John going through here. This is not just a little boo-hooing. John, John is just literally broken over this. And so he sh he's just weeping. But because he's premature in his weeping, notice what one of the elders says. He says, stop weeping. There, there's no, you know, weep a little bit more. It's okay. <laughs> It's going to be okay. What does he say? He says, stop. It's immediate. Don't continue. All right? And, and he gives this command. He says, behold. You know what I'm saying? In other words, when you see that word, behold, something important is about to happen. So stop weeping. Behold. All right? And the elder, he was aware that there is one who is able to break the seals and open the scroll. And who is that? Jesus. It's Jesus Christ himself. And notice, he, he's proclaimed by two messianic titles in these verses. The first one is, he is the line that is from the tribe of Judah. Notice that? Mm -hmm. All right. That's taken all the way back to Genesis 49, verses 8 through 10. And it's derived from Jacob's blessings on the tribe of Judah. But then he could be called, calls him a second title. He says, the root of David. And that's derived from Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 10. And that title is used exclusively throughout the, the Gospels for the Messiah. Joe, mm -hmm. wouldn't John know that Jesus would be the one that would do it because he was one of the disciples and you, he followed yeah, him? You would think so. You know, it just, that, I never understood that, that he was weeping because you think that you would think he would know, right? He had seen him risen, right? So uh, I'm sure that this this was some... He certainly understood that. But then when he didn't see it happening, that probably was the trigger point. I, I thought the same thing, exact same thing. Right? God is human, yeah. as we are human. And we proclaim to have the hope and the future and everything. And how many times do we weep instead of letting God have it? Yeah, amen. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. Yeah, we're frail people, mm -hmm. right? We, sometimes we don't remember what we know. That happens, mm -hmm. right? Um, notice that he says that Jesus is able to unseal the scrolls because he is what? Overcome. Overcome. He has overcome. So Christ defeated all at the cross. Amen? Mm -hmm. He defeated sin. He defeated death. He defeated all the forces of hell. He defeated Satan. Here's the good thing. Because we know Christ, all believers are overcome here just because of his work on the cross. Amen. 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 So let, let's not run past that. Let, let's, let's stay there for a little bit. Let's let that one soak in. Because sometimes in our lives, 
You know, we let Satan accuse us again and again and again of sin that, that has been part of our lives or that something we did years ago. What, what does God say? He's forgiven us for all, right? He separated our sin as far as the east is from the west. He remembers it no more. Why should we beat ourselves up? Amen? Amen. Why should we let Satan accuse us? He is the accuser, but we belong to who? The one that defeated him. So there's great, great, great hope in that. It's one of the things as a pastor, I talk to so many people that they revisit the sin of their past life. It it just hamstrings them. It kills them. It shackles them. And I say, oh, don't pick up those chains and put them back on. Because Christ cut them off. Amen? Amen? So he overcomes all, and because of what he has done for us, we overcome all. Great word, right? But then notice that Jesus is described as a lamb, not as a lion. Did you notice that? He gives him the title of a lion from the tribe of Judah, but then he's described as a lamb. Right? So he had to be the lamb before he could be the line of judgment of the world. He had to do that. He had to go to the cross. Now, lamb here is an interesting word. It literally means little lamb. And it's referring back to the Passover lamb that, that was purchased by families. That lamb would live with the family for four days from the time of purchase to the time of sacrifice. Now, how many of you have had little kids? One time or another. With animals. All right, I put yourself in, the, in a, a Jewish family's situation. A bunch of little kids and a young lamb you just purchased. What happens? They're going to fall in love with Those it. Those kids fall in love with it, right? It was bittersweet when they had to sacrifice that lamb, right? So the picture here is that Christ is the little lamb, right? He's given his all. And the Messiah, it's interesting, is only referred to as a lamb once in the Old Testament. That's in Isaiah 53, verse 7. And only four times outside of Revelation as a lamb. That's in John 1.29, John 1.36, Acts 8.32, and 1 Peter 1.19. But then we come to the book of Revelation, and Christ is referred to as the Lamb over 31 times. He is the Savior. He is the one that gave it all for us. Amen? So, notice also that this is no ordinary slain lamb. What happens when you slay a lamb? What happens? They die. Yes. They die. Right? But he's not dead. He is standing, looking as if he had been slain. In other words, he's resurrected. Amen? And he has seven horns on his head, symbolizing perfect and complete strength and power. Right? He has the power to overcome all wickedness and all evil. Seven is the number of what? Perfection, right? He has seven eyes, symbolizing that he has got complete and perfect omniscience and complete and perfect knowledge and understanding. And notice the direct linkage between the eyes to the Holy Spirit and to the seven spirits of God. Did you notice that? Yes. So you want pictures of Trinitarian work? <clears throat> there it is right there. Right? You've got God on the throne. You've got Son, the Lamb. You've got the Holy Spirit. Seven spirits of God. There it is. Right? Nowhere in Scripture will you see the word Trinity, but you see it all the time, all the way through. Right? And he searches the entire world to carry out his judgment and watch over evil. Amen? Mm -hmm. So nothing can get past him. Can I ask a question? Yeah. The seven spirits of God, I might have missed something you said. What 
are the seven spirits of God? It's the perfection, the completeness. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah, that's what it's talking about. All right. So look at verse 7. Verse 7 says this, And he came and he took it out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. This is the culmination of chapters 4 and 5. All right? He comes and he takes the book himself. It demonstrates his ability to break those seals and to begin the final judgment that we're going to see play out in chapter 6 all the way through. Now this is the same scene that we see back in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. Even though the scroll is not explicitly mentioned there, it's the same exact scene. Right? I'm confused again. Who sat on the throne? Wasn't that Jesus? This is God. No. Yeah. All right. So look at verses 8 through 14. This is where they begin the song of the worthy one. So the lambs, the lambs' act of taking the scroll causes all of heaven to break out in praise. Do you notice that? Right? All heaven realizes what's about to happen. They're all excited that that Satan is about to be destroyed, that evil is going to be uh, vindicated, that that death is no longer going to be reigning. All of heaven breaks out in a song. And the believing remnant of Israel will be saved, and the church is going to be exalted and honored in the midst of all of this. And Christ is about to return to earth to, to claim his rightful throne and to begin his thousand-year reign. So there is all of this stuff that's happening, and, and all of heaven begins to realize what's about to occur. Have you ever been in a situation where it looks bleak and difficult and hard and terrible and then all of a sudden things change in an instant have you ever been there what what do you do praise god. you praise god right mm -hmm. now ron is not here yet he's at another meeting but ron most of you don't may not know this but ron had throat cancer several years ago and he was having some similar signs so when he had throat cancer this past couple of weeks, he went in today to have a test to see what was going on. They found nothing. Praise God. So Ron was bouncing off the walls in here earlier. When all of, none of you were here, he'd gone crazy. He's excited. Praise God, right? So no wonder heaven is breaking out in praise. Because this is a good thing. But no, notice that the, this praise, it's spontaneous and it accelerates into a crescendo of worship. And there are three doxologies in this text that are added to those that are in chapter 4. Right? The four living creatures and the 24 elders, they fall down before who? The Lamb. The Lamb. They fall down before Christ. Right? And they did the, that earlier when they fell down before the Ancient of Days. You remember that back in chapter 4, verse 10? It signals that Christ is God, since only God can be worshipped. Amen? Amen? And notice that the elders were holding two things. Now, there's been a lot of confusion over this. Some people say that, you know, it's the four creatures that are holding these things. The Greek gives us the... the the, the true meaning. It's the elders that are holding these two items. First, they're holding harps. Did you notice that? Their harps are associated with two things in Scripture. First, they're associated with worship. We see that in Scripture all the time. But the second thing they're associated with is prophecy. Right? And then they're holding golden bowls of incense. And that's associated with the prayers of the saints. Right? And it, it, they're using this Old Testament imagery that symbolizes the priestly work of intercession and the prayers of the saints. Right? So church, you know, one of the things that we can't grow tired of is prayer. Right? Because this scene gives us a picture of what's happening. Our prayers are going up before the throne of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's not forget that. All right? That's easy to forget. 
especially when things are hard and difficult. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're like me, sometimes my head just shuts down. My heart shuts down mm -hmm. and I forget that I can bring all things to him. Mm -hmm. So let, let's not do that. And then it says that they sang a new song. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. Note that nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible are angels described as singing. The only possible exception is in Job 38.7. So it's probably the elders that are singing here. Okay? And in Scripture, we only see the redeemed singing a new song. And only angels speaking it. So it's probably the elders and the redeemed that are, that are out praising God. Okay? Then this new song is also always associated with a song of redemption right and the new song it opens with this repeated proclamation that the lamb is worthy to break the seals did you notice that mm -hmm. you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation so what are they proclaiming that Christ died for all all so what should we as people be doing? Praising God, Praising God, worshiping Him, sharing His word to who? Everybody. Everybody. Even the person you don't like. Mm -hmm. right? You know, e even, even that family member, you know, your strange uncle that shows up on Thanksgiving? Yeah, share the word with him. That boss that you don't like, share your word with him. That neighbor that throws stuff over the fence into your backyard, share stuff, share the word with him. Praise God. I mean, you know, Christ died for all. We are to share Christ with all. Amen. Amen. This word purchase that he uses here, it's literally the word that's meant for the redemptions of slaves in the marketplace and then they're set free. Who, who are non-Christian slave to? Sin. Sin. Yeah. Satan. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2 is very clear that we, before we knew Christ, we were in enmity with God. We were slaves of Satan. So that's what he, the picture here is that we have been purchased. We are now free. Praise God. Amen? Amen. And then he says, you have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will what? Reign, Reign upon, upon the earth. earth. Who's he talking about? Us. Us. Do you notice that? We're all priests. Right? Everybody. <clears throat> There's no gender restriction on this one, gang. Amen? Amen? Amen. Right? We'll all reign on earth. There's no restriction on that. It's those who know God. It says there's a kingdom, right? It's a community of believers under God's sovereign rule. We are priests to our God. We have complete and total access to God himself. Amen. Yeah. And we reign upon the earth. We will reign with Christ in his millennium. Wow. Isn't that amazing? So do you, do you see, even though this book is a book of great trouble many times, do you see the great encouragement in the midst of it? It's wonderful. And in verse 11, I want you to notice that the entire army of heaven's angels join in the praise. Myriad literally means 10,000. Then when he says myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, he's literally saying there's an uncounted number of angels that have joined the praise of God. Can you imagine what that's like in heaven? All of that going on, the four creatures, the 24 elders, all these angels <clears throat> praising God before heaven. Hebrews 12.1 says that the angels in heaven cannot be counted. Right? Revelation 12 through 4 says that heaven's angels are twice the number of Satan's angels. And they can't be counted. Amen? Amen. They praise Christ. 
that his death provided redemption, that he has the right to pow the rightful power to fulfill God's plan, and that his riches become because all creation belongs to him. Everything belongs to Christ. Praise God. And his wisdom and omniscience because he knows the beginning from the end. He knows it all. Nothing's going to catch him by surprise. Amen. Amen. Then all creation joins in praising Christ for endless blessings, honor, glory, and worship. You can see the Psalms there. Psalm 69, Psalm 150. They all reveal and they all tell that all of creation praises God. Right? And then the chapter ends with this word. It says, Amen. Amen. It literally means, let it be, make it happen. Right? So, we read this chapter so many times, we run past it. We, we forget to, to look at it in depth. But there is so much here to be of such good encouragement to us. Even in the midst of trial and tribulation. Right? So tonight, we've got three questions for you to, to begin to discuss. First, the picture in chapter 5 is that there's only one able to open the seals. How would you explain this as the gospel to an unbelieving friend? How would you tell that story to an unbelieving friend? That Christ is the only one able to unbreak the seals. Number two, worship of the Lamb is a huge emphasis in chapter 5. Why? And how are you doing in your worship of the Lamb? Let's, let's, let's bring it down where the rubber meets the road. Right? And number three, worship is a big event in heaven. What implications does that have for us here on earth now? Right? So that's your three questions to, to maybe banter back and forth tonight. We've got, I don't know, about 25, 26 here tonight. Maybe you can divide into three groups of about eight. Maybe one over here, one back there, one up here. And spend the next 25 minutes chatting about those three, and then we'll come back together in 25 minutes and close out. Amen? Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.